like movies with lots of gory kills and violence, then you're going to want to stick around for this one. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're looking at Mario Bava's classic body count film, Bay of Blood. Released in 1971, with a multitude of alternate titles, including my favorite, Twitch of the Death Nerve, Bava's film had a profound influence on American slasher cinema. This film essentially drew the blueprint for the subgenre years before it officially became a thing. But just how sick is Bava's beloved stock and kill flick? Let's get to the gore and find out. The film opens with these scenic shots of an Italian lake. Man, it sure is nice out here. Would suck if something bad were to happen. Inside a nearby house, this old lady is rolling around in her wheelchair, ready to call it a day. Too bad for her, she rolls right into this jump scare. I guess Granny didn't have a life alert bracelet. Her mysterious killer then surveys his handiwork. I wonder who this mystery individual is. Well, I guess that solves that. He hears a strange noise and heads off to investigate. But by the time he gets to the door, the Jehovah's Witnesses have already bailed. Sorry, too creepy out here for us. He heads back inside where Granny is still just hanging out. But surprise, before he can leave, he gets stabbed repeatedly. Man, Mario Bava wasn't messing around here. From there, we jump to this other couple. Dude kinda looks like he could be Steve on Stranger Things' dad if you squint a bit. Man, look at that gold chain. What a pimp. Anyway, he's all like, hey, I hate to hump and run, but you know how it is. I gotta pick up some conditioner to keep my chest mane all soft and silky. His girlfriend's not buying it, though. You could at least tell me where you're going. Hey, babe, let's not make a scene here. From there, it's back to the bay, where someone's peeping on this fisherman. So look, you're probably going to need a scorecard to keep all the characters this movie throws at you straight. The good news is, most of them just turn up to die. At any rate, this other dude shows up, and I have no idea who he is either, but then this lady snatches the binoculars. <laughs> Give me those. You can't even spy on people properly. Turns out the guy with the net is an entomologist. Fisherman dude's like, hey, sorry to bug you, but would you mind buzzing off? Then they debate the merits of killing stuff. You make me feel like a murderer. I'm not saying that, Mr. Fasati. But if you kill for killing's sake, you become a monster. Christ, man, maybe lay off the caffeine. They're bugs. They then discuss whether the Countess earlier really killed herself or if it was murder. Captain Crazy here is definitely team suicide. The police said suicide. Oh, of course, of course. Meanwhile, Frank's over here trying to find out where his latest shipment of fat gold chains is. What do you mean they're still out for delivery? I need them to accentuate my pecs. Actually, he's finagling some sort of land deal. And if you guessed it's a land deal behind all these murders so far, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. I figured that in about three weeks we can start with the blasting, more or less, but I'll need the permits. And because this movie didn't already have enough characters, here are some more. Everyone give a warm sick flicks welcome to our horny young adults. And hey, look at how happy their car is to be in this movie. He's smiling like a butcher's dog. They arrive at this cozy little villa, and the place has a dance floor, but I'm not so sure I'd risk swimming in this pool. Bava does give us this fancy panning shot right into the rack focus, though. Mario Bava really was a legitimately skilled director. I had a fantastic eye for scene composition. While they're working on their routine for this year's Eurovision, we head over here where Susie Sue is consulting her tarot cards. I see bugs in your future. Paul! The least you could do is to answer when I call. Stop shouting, you disturbing little Ferdinand. Damn, she's really got psychic powers. She's not done, though. She's got more predictions. The clouds are swirling. There will be tears shed over the bay. And we do get some exposition here, at least. And the only reason I hate him is because he wants to transform the bay into a sea of cement. Back at Eurovision rehearsals, someone's trying to peep on the act. 
Now I know exactly what their performance will be. Practice breaks, and they wind up at this place, where Corporal Buzzkill here breaks down the law. Gillian, come on, kids. This is private property. We can't break into a house like this. It's against the law. Hilda decides it's a great time for skinny dipping in the bay, and I'm sure that's going to work out great for her. I mean, what could go wrong, right? While someone's peeping on her, her friends are busy pulling a little B&E at this abandoned house. Hey, anyone home? We need some feedback on our Eurovision performance. With the house empty, they get back to it. Their new number is kind of strange. Not really sure the judges are going to like the cultural appropriation. While the dudes are arguing, Goldilocks here heads off to explore. This bed is just right. Meanwhile, Hilda's out here taking the longest skinny dip ever when she catches her foot on something. Oh <laughs> look, it's a rotting corpse. He gives her a little goose, and then she flees back to the house to warn the others. Too bad for her, she winds up in the wrong house. But she's not alone, so she takes off with the cameraman in hot pursuit. She's about to make it to safety, but look out! She gets scythed and bleeds out on the lawn. The upside is that no one will need to fertilize here. Back inside, it's sexy time. And while slasher film tropes weren't really invented until after Bay of Blood, I think it's pretty safe to say this isn't going to end well for them either. Someone's still creeping around outside, but they clearly flunked out a ninja academy because they alert Bobby when they knock over this pot. <laughs> Look, I expected there to be some pot in this movie, but this wasn't what I had in mind. Bobby goes to investigate like a dope and walks right into this jump scare. I'm no doctor, but that's probably going to require stitches. Hey, look, if you don't mind, I'm going to need that cleaver back. I'm not really sure why he needed it back, though, because now he's about to do a little spear fishing. It's a two for one. If you see this scene and find yourself thinking, hey, this looks a lot like that kill in Friday the 13th Part 2, well, you're 100% right. Steve Miner borrowed this kill for inclusion in his film. It's no exaggeration to say that Bava had a huge influence on what would become modern slasher cinema. So, all the horny kids might be dead, but that car is still smiling. Wait, is that car the killer? Back at Villa Day Bug, Susie Sue's cards have revealed some new information. She heads off to tell Hubby, but he's gone, and all that's there is a bug on a pin. Could this be foreshadowing? Fun fact, Bava professed to feel very guilty for pinning this living bug on the needle. Who said horror filmmakers were all sadists? Hey, remember the binocular spies from earlier? Well, they're still in this movie. And clearly they have different parenting styles. It took me a half hour to get them to sleep. Why didn't you turn the light out? Because the children are afraid of the dark, you know that. They're out for a little late night drive and wind up at the entomologist's house. Maybe they just need a tarot reading. And now it's time for some exposition. And really, I feel like we might be a little overdue at this point. Uh, as I was saying, uh, your father wasn't exactly beyond reproach. He was, in a word, uh, vice-ridden. We also learn that there are plans afoot to turn the bay into a resort, much to the chagrin of the locals. Get this idea to transform the bay into a fashionable resort that was doomed to fail. And we learn that Renata is the daughter of the guy who killed his wife and was subsequently murdered in the first minutes of the film. I really came to find out about my father's disappearance. Not to hear moral judgment passed on him. Man, this really was a lot of exposition. But wait, there's more. Turns out Crazy Fisherman Dude is the Countess's illegitimate son. Didn't you know that Simon is the offspring of her secret affair? Uh -huh. Man, this is like an Italian days of our lives at this point. Afterwards, dude's all like, hey, thanks for stopping by. Come back if you ever want to see my bugs. Since we haven't seen Harry Chess Gold Chain Dude, aka Frank, in a while, this seems like a great time to catch up with him. He's on the phone. Hey, how come I'm not getting more screen time in this movie? Wait, what? I'm on screen now? Why didn't anyone tell me? Hubby and wife go to see Crazy Fisherman, whose name is Simon, and make this startling discovery. Oh, Albert, it's my father. You didn't know anything, huh? Oh, no, Albert, it's horrible. Guess the calamari objected to be in the main course. I found him in the sea, yeah. Well, guess we can mark that mystery as solved. They had for Frank's swinging bachelor pad, and man, does everyone just wander into other people's houses in Italy? Do they not knock over there? 
Anyway, the place appears empty, but Frank's really just hiding in here for some reason. While Hubby's off getting the car, Wifey finds the guy's collection of dead corpses. Dahmer's was probably better, but this is a solid start. Also, I love that trippy zoom effect. She's ready to dip out, but surprise, here's Hank and his hatchet. Renata tries to lock herself in with the corpses, but he's like, let me in, I really gotta go. Then she stabs him. Didn't see that coming. Hubby runs back for the Benz and sees Susie Sue, who heads off to investigate. Guess this place is in the same jungle as the cemetery in City of the Living Dead based on this foley work. Back down at the water, they're hard at work shooting this new Susie and the Banshees video. Looks great. Susie's creeping around outside Simon's shack, and I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that's probably a bad idea. Everything's getting crazy now, so Renata sends Albert off after the entomologist. Why? There's no time to lose now, Albert. I'll explain later. Hurry before he calls the police. Stop him before he ruins everything, Albert. <laughs> well, that seems like a pretty good reason. She's like, dude, man up. I've already stabbed someone. Start pulling your weight. The entomologist runs home and gets on the phone to call his agent to find out why he's not the star of this movie. But before he can get through, he gets choked out with the phone cord. Albert's like, I'm just going to pretend this is my bossy wife. Yeah, that's the ticket. If you were concerned that Frank's girlfriend had just vanished without a trace, don't worry. She's still in this movie, too. She's making a phone call. And I feel like there's a lot of phone calls in this movie. Susie finds the corpse of Frank, but I guess her tarot cards forgot to warn her about this hatchet. Heads are gonna roll over this, literally. Albert and his wife reconvene just so she can browbeat him some more. Oh, Albert, will you stop being such an old maid? You have to rely on instinct in certain situations. Everything's coming up Millhouse for their plans to acquire the bay, but there's one last hurdle to be dealt with. Simon. All we have to do is get rid of Simon. They head off under the cover of Blue Filter Night to finish things once and for all, but are nearly spotted by the secretary. <laughs> Look, there's no way she saw them, but far be it for me to complain about getting another kill. What if she saw us? What happens then? What happened to the others? Inside, she discovers a little surprise of her own. Frank is still alive. She runs off to find Simon, but he's not there. He really should have left a note. Sorry I missed you, off disposing of corpses. Back in 15. He does show up eventually, but he's really not good at the whole being a host to house guest thing. You wanted to marry him, you slut! You were even ready to school Ventura! Then it's time for some expository flashbacks. Because sure, why not? I've already told you, Mr. Ventura, I do not wish to sell the bay. The Countess isn't selling, but after they lift her diary, conveniently left wide open on her desk, they hatch the murder plan. And just in case you hadn't figured this all out already, they're going to spell it out for you. On the 13th of February, Donati will kill his Contessa. A page from this diary, her suicide note, will be found near the body. Back in the present, Simon's not buying it. He's gonna kill her, but she offers him a nice face full of scalding water instead. I gotta admit, he's pretty resilient for a guy who just took boiling water to the face and proceeds to choke her out. <laughs> but before she dies, there's time for another flashback. Here, she's plotting with the Countess's husband. Laura, it's not that easy. We've discussed it already. What if it fails? It won't fail. fail. Narrator voice. It failed. Back in the present, Simon grabs his blade and heads out. Seriously, guess that water was just like room temperature or something. Guy doesn't even have a blister. Time for another flashback. This time revealing that Frank and Simon are in cahoots. I think we all pretty much knew this by this point, but thanks, I guess. Of course, all this really means is it's time for Simon to die. And die he does. Turned into a human shish kebab by Albert. Look at Simon, as crazy in death as he was in life. Renata and Albert are searching for paperwork, but then the lights go out. That can't be good. 
Albert's creeping around with the brightest match in the universe lighting his way, but Wifey is missing. Answer, Rennie. Look, dude, I'm no marriage counselor, but do you really want to find her? She's not that nice to you. After some more cat and mouse, Albert and Frank square off in the least inspiring fight to the death ever. Renata watches as one shadowy figure emerges victorious, but who is it? I really never thought you had it in you. Wait, are we in another flashback? We'll come back and... And the whole bay will be legally ours. No, oh, guess not. And then we come to this twist ending. Right. <laughs> Mommy! Daddy! Man, that kid's a hell of a shot. Look, no one saw that coming. Those crazy kids are like, hooray, we're orphans! There's no denying that Baba's Bay of Blood had a profound impact on American slasher cinema. The body count formula Baba used in this feature laid the groundwork for what was to come in less than a decade. On top of that, it was a key catalyst in terms of pushing the envelope for violence and gore in cinema. Will that be enough to earn it five barf bags? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Bay of Blood delivers. While this may not be super extreme by today's standards, for 1971 this was some real pushing the envelope type of stuff. We're treated to a throat slashing, multiple impalements, several stranglings, a cleaver to the face, and a decapitation. Again, not super splattery by today's standards, but Carlo Rambaldi's special effects are quite memorable. Because of that, I'm giving Bay of Blood three barf bags out of five. This is a great film with historical importance, and the gore is the bloody icing on the cake. Looking for another Italian slasher film? Then be sure to check out my review of Dario Argento's Phenomena. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.